In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today, um, I have four points, um, all starting with P. Presence, persecution, passions, and persistence. We start with the Gospel today from um, Luke's Gospel. The story of uh, healing of the blind man. This is in all the, all, the gos- all the synoptic gospels, what they call synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, because they're all um, very similar. And um, th- there are slight differences in the story between the three gospels. In um, this gospel we have one blind man, um, but uh, the others have two. Math- Matthew has two, Mark has one. And so the, the church fathers talk about this, and say, is there, is there something wrong here? No, it's just like um, if, you had, if you have a car accident and a number of people saw it and they all had to write down what they saw, they'd be reporting different things. But also the, uh, the fathers say that the apostles have the, uh, the right, if you like, to emphasize different things. It seems though that the, con- the conclusion is there were two, but one of them was known to the church because he's actually named. In tomorrow's gospel reading, he's actually, it's actually the same passage from Mark, same story from Mark, and he's called Blind Bartimaeus. So there's no problem with the differences between the, the, the stories in the different gospels, and um, so we don't have to worry about that. But the story is that Jesus is going to Jericho, and um, he uh, is walking along with a crowd of people, and uh, the blind man hears the people going by and he has to ask what's happening because he can't see and uh, they tell him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by which is interesting because his response is to call out Jesus son of David have mercy on me not Jesus of Nazareth have mercy on me and Jesus son of David is a, is a messianic term. So the blind man who couldn't see Jesus saw something else and he realized that this is there's something going on here. It's very interesting um, uh, in, a, in a, an art, a, a magazine, I, a paper I read regularly, there was a heading recently in the paper, it said um, hang on, I better just look this up, make sure I get it right. Um, it said uh, JFK assassination doctors break silence dispute key government claim multiple doctors who were in the emergency room with President John F. Kennedy after his, uh, he was shot raised doubts about official narratives that was, this is in the papers in the last week or so JF Kennedy was assassinated in 1963 a long time ago Coincidentally, recently I came across a book uh, called JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters. And I thought, I'll read that, because I'm one of, the, I'm one of these people who can remember exactly where he was and exactly what he was doing when I heard the news that JFK Kennedy had been assassinated all those years ago, 40-something years ago, nearly 50 years ago. And when I read the book, uh, I'll tell you the conclusion that I'll... I'll tell you the conclusion of the book. I'm convinced that the CIA did it now. Absolutely convinced. From what uh, this person has done the research on over the, uh, what he's found out. But one of, the peop- one of the pieces of evidence came from a man, not who was blind, but a man who was deaf. And he was on a bridge overlooking the motorcade as they went, uh, went past. And so all the people, they're distracted by the noise of the crowd, the noise of the vehicles, the noise of the motorcycles, the noise of everybody shouting and everything else. But he can't hear a thing. This person, this witness, couldn't hear a thing. All he could do was see. And because he couldn't hear, his, his attention to detail was far, far greater than those, the rest of the people. And he saw things that nobody else saw. And it's all part of the puzzle to unravel this unbelievable people call it a conspiracy, but actually it's tr- the truth, this unbelievable thing that the CIA did to kill the President of the United States. So what I'm trying to illustrate there is that when we have one of our senses uh, cut off, 
the other ones become more, more alert. Now this blind man, he couldn't see. What the people could see was Jesus from Nazareth, a man walking along the street. That's all they saw. But something else happened to him that he picked up. It's interesting, um, St. Cyril of um, Alexandria uh, refers us to Psalm 145, verse 8, and, uh, which says this in the Orthodox Study Bible, The Lord restores those broken down. The Lord gives wisdom to the blind. That's in the Psalms there. The Lord gives wisdom to the blind. And, um, and then he made this comment in his commentary on this passage. Who has taught you to speak thus, O man? He's, he's talking to the blind man. Have you, though deprived of sight, read scriptures? How have you discerned the light of the world? You can't see, you can't read, you can't see the light. Truly, the Lord enlightens the blind. And then um, St. Saint John Chrysostom actually gives us the, the, the clue which lit up this whole sermon for me. Um, and St. John says this, There was a multitude of people around the person of Jesus. The blind man could not see the light of truth. But in his soul, he could feel his presence. He could feel his presence. He could feel that this was God walking past. And so he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. How does that work, you say? I remember, many, uh, I remember reading the, the biography of um, St. Elizabeth. We have the last icon there, over there in the row. St. Elizabeth of Russia. And uh, she attended the funeral of St. Seraphim of Sarov. She was there. Many, many people turned out. Thousands and thousands of people were there. And she wrote to her grandmother about the experience. And her grandmother, of course, is Queen Victoria. And uh, Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth was uh, Queen Victoria's favorite granddaughter. And she said, it was like being in the New Testament because people were being healed as St. Seraphim's um, body was being taken past them. Coming from the presence of that holy man was God's presence going into the crowds and healing people. And at the end, there were piles, apparently there were piles of crutches which they left, were left there to burn. So, so you, you didn't have to have this, you know, really touch. You could feel the presence of God even though it wasn't, it was just going, going past there. And this blind man, he felt his presence. That's what John Chrysostom says. He felt his presence. Have you ever felt God's presence? I think, you know what? I think most of you will have. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Because the whole pressure of our society is to keep us away from God, keep us away from church. But if you've felt God, nothing, nothing will keep you away from God. Nothing could keep this man quiet and nothing will keep you away from church. We need to feel the presence of God. Christianity is not an intellectual exercise where we sort of think about it all rationally, think, yeah, this is probably the, the best way to go. Um, it's uh, something to be experienced. A verse that I learned from the New English Bible many, many years ago, Philippians 3.10, it said, all I care for is to know Christ. That's the St. Paul. All I care for is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And... I learned that in that version. But I came across another version recently uh, in the New English Translation. And it says this, My aim is to know him and to experience the power of his resurrection. This is what we're encouraging us all to do.
experience of God is necessary for the spiritual and mental health of every created thing, including human beings. Knowledge of God is not intellectual, but existential. It has to be experienced. According to Andrew Louth, who's an Eastern theologian, the purpose of theology as a science is to prepare for contemplation rather than theology being the purpose of contemplation. Catechumens, next week. We're going to make some catechumens next week. You will have completed the... Well, you, you're working on the Foundations course. But I wanted to say that doing the Foundations course is not an end in itself. You, know, you get to the end of the course, you get your little certificate, and you think, I'm Orthodox. And you get everything else, I'm Orthodox. That's not the, the purpose of the um, Foundations course. It's to give you the resources, the desire, if you like, to experience God. There's too many distractions in this world. And the more distractions we have, the less we will experience God. So we have to fight for the time to give to God, to where we can be quiet and listen to God. Um, the blind, the deaf man on the bridge saw more than anyone else who was watching because they were distracted by all the sounds. Um, this is why Saint Saroff, uh, Saint Seraphim of Saroff, Saint Theophlan the Recluse, um, Saint Paisios, they withdraw from society to pray, to be alone. Saint Seraphim of Saroff was on his own for 25 years before he came out and God said, now it's time for you to go into the world and do what you have to do. 25 years. In our modern culture, everything's instant. You know, instant potatoes, instant whatever. And we think, well, you know, if somebody lays hands on me, if I made a catechumen, I'm there. It doesn't work like that. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. But the aim is to experience, to feel the presence of God. So that was presence. The second one was uh, there's presence and then there is uh, persecution. The fathers give, oh actually there's one more thing before I go on to that. The fathers give a spiritual interpretation of this miracle with the blind man. Symbol, he says the blind man symbolizes future generations, that's us, who will come to faith only by hearing, without the benefit of seeing Christ in person. We will never see Christ in person, walking as people did in his time on this earth. But he is a symbol of us, this blind man, because we can find faith just by hearing. Hearing the preaching, hearing the word of God read, and so on and so on. That's wonderful. Okay, then we come to the persecution, the second one. Uh, it says in verse 39 of today's Gospel, Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Exactly who those who went before uh, were is not clear. But they must have regarded the title he gave to Jesus as well as his petition as inappropriate. It's likely that they rejected the title since it was one normally given to the Messiah, the expected Messiah. Even if they had respect for this person, Jesus of Nazareth, as a prophet, they were not ready to admit that kind of confession, that he was the Messiah. It's not likely that they were just concerned citizens who wanted to see good order maintained or that they didn't want Jesus to be interrupted as he went along teaching. Those who try to silence the blind man are the persecutors and the tyrants who are in every generation who try to silence the church. And it's happening in our generation too. If, you're, if you've got your eyes open, if you're listening to news, if you're whatever, the, uh, the current government, current uh, um, federal government, is slowly, slowly tightening the screws on the church. Our own government in Victoria is doing the same as well. They're even now, the latest I heard, the latest email I had 
is saying that um, they're trying to change the laws so that if um, something to do with um, uh, if if we're accused of something, if they, 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 they accuse us of discrimination, which they often do, Christians of discrimination because we disagree with something, and we go to court, at the moment, the person who takes us to court has to pay the costs. But they're going to change that so that we have to pay the costs. So I'm accused of saying something that somebody doesn't like. They take me to court, I have to pay the costs. This is the, the things that they're tightening all the time on us. And the schools, of course, they're trying to force us now to, to teach children what we don't believe in. So why, is it, why would that make it a Christian school anymore? So this is... So these people who went before the blind man, who went before Jesus, um, they are the picture of what happens in every generation, including ours. Unfortunately, but there's a saying: the blood of the church is the seed of the martyrs. The seed of the martyrs is the. How does it go? Oh gosh, the blood of the church is the seed of the martyrs, or something, or seed of the church. Sorry, that's it. So when persecution comes, guess what? The church will grow. It will grow, uh, and the, and the, the the persecutors have never worked it out, <laughs> but they make it very difficult for us. Okay. So that's the uh, first two, pers presence, persecution. Now we have the passions. Um, because the, the fathers are unanimous in seeing this rebuke or reprimand from these people who went before as a figure of the forces that strive to keep us from confessing Christ. I've mentioned persecutions, but there's also passions. St. Gregory the Great says, Whom do they signify who went before Jesus as he came? if not the crowd of carnal desires and the tumult of the vices, which before Christ makes entry into our hearts, scatter our thoughts with their temptations and confuse the pleading of the soul in prayer. For often, when we desire to turn again to the Lord, the images of the sins we have committed rise against us. They war against the fervour of our soul. They darken the spirit and strive to silence the voice of our supplication. So this is another thing, not just the external persecution, but the internal, the passions rise up and try to stop us from praying, try to stop us from coming to church, try to stop us from whatever, when it comes to being close to God and experiencing his presence. Which takes me to the last point, the, pers the persistence. And I'm going to take this from uh, the epistle for today, which was in Ephesians. Turn to it in my Bible here. Ephesians. And it starts off, the passage we had today starts off, uh, well, actually, just before that, it says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So, especially the catechumens were saying, You were in darkness, and then you move into the light. And the difference between darkness and light is like the difference between darkness and light. I mean, there's, there's no light where there's darkness. And so what they're saying is, what St. Paul is saying here to these Christians in Ephesus, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to follow Christ, you've got to live a different life to what you were living before in darkness. It's got to be totally different. Totally different. Christians are different. They have to be. And I, I want to use... Um, a, a slight, a, a different version. J.B. Phillips, who was an uh, English Anglican priest who translated the whole. Word. He was an, he was a Greek uh, expert, and he translated this passage in a way which brings it alive for me. Okay, and I'm going to use this. Live life then with a due sense of responsibility, not as men who do not know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time. Time, we're so under pressure these days, time-wise, aren't we? There's so many things. There's a TV, there's a radio, there's podcasts, there's, there's films, there's parties, there's you name it, we can do it, and it can fill up our whole life. Young, young people, those of you catechumens who are young, 
and not married yet, believe it or not, this, at this time of your life, you have more time now than you will ever have it for the rest of your life once you get married and have children and grandchildren and everything else. Make the best use of your time. Study the scriptures. Read spiritual books. Attend the services. This is the priority. The best use of your time. Despite all the difficulties of these days. Don't be vague but firmly grasp grasp what you know to be the will of God. So what do you know is, is the will of God? How do you find out what the will of God is? It's in the scriptures. We need to read the scriptures. And we have a, we try here to read the scriptures. There's, there's a group that goes through every two years. We read the whole of the scriptures from cover to cover. And I'd encourage you uh, something went out this week in the weekly email list. You can go on into the weekly email, the bottom of my, of my introduction. You can click on it and you can download a plan to get you through the next two years reading the whole of the scriptures from cover to cover. And there's a group of us doing that and, I hope, and I've been doing that for years. Before, before I became Orthodox, I used to get through it in, in every, every year, the whole Bible. But it wasn't such a big book. <laughs> because we didn't have the Apocrypha, what we call the Apocrypha in the Western Church, in the book, in the Bible. So I encourage you, read the scriptures from cover to cover every two years so you find out what the will of God is for you. Also, young, something I was told when I was a young man, Proverbs. You know how many Proverbs there are? 31 chapters. So on the first of the month, you read chapter one. Second of the month, you read chapter two. Third of the month, you read chapter three. And you get through to uh, the 31st of the month. If it's, if it's a leap year, you only have 28 chapters to read. Then you go back to chapter 1 again for the next month. And you keep going through. Very good wisdom there for young men especially, but also for young women as well. So I'd encourage you to do that, to find the will of God um, and, and apply it to your life. And it says here, this is how uh, J.B. Phillips translated don't let your stimulus, don't get your stimulus from wine. For there is always the danger of excessive drink drinking. But let the Spirit stimulate your souls. Let the Spirit dis stimulate your souls. That's what he says there. I, I really love that. So how do, we, how do we do this? It's cafes, really. Confession, almsgiving, fasting, and... Um, uh, Eucharist, scriptures, saints, and then all undergirded with prayer. And then he finishes off, express your joy in singing among yourselves, with singing among yourselves psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making music in your hearts for the ears of God. Thank God at all times for everything in the name of Jesus Christ and fit in with everyone because, you're common, because of your common reverence for Christ. That's actually past the reading for the day. Fit in with each other because of your common reverence for Christ. When you come into this church, this is for the catechumens again, you might be surprised that it's not perfect. Wherever you, I remember once I was, I was uh, looking for the perfect church and somebody who with great wisdom said to me, he said, Jeffrey, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as a perfect church. Wherever you find human beings, you'll find sin, you'll find problems, you'll find challenges. And so this is why St. Paul is saying here, fit in with each other because of your common reverence for Christ. We have to remember, we all love the Lord Jesus Christ. We might disagree about this or that, we might choose this or that political party, or we might choose this or that football team. But we all have reverence for Christ, so therefore we all fit in with each other. This is our calling. So, uh, there we have it for today. Um, per the presence of Christ, have you felt the presence of Christ? You must. And you must persevere, you must persist in, in your reading of the scriptures, praying, attending churches and so on. And, uh, and you will eventually feel his presence, I am sure. Don't worry about the persecution, it's frightening, but God will be with us through it and struggle against our passions. That's what being a Christian is, struggling against our passions. 
keep struggling. Don't give up. Amen. May to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit be ascribed to Almighty Majesty, Dominion and praise now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen.